Despite these well-documented restrictions on spontaneous code switching and a somewhat looser but still coherent use of code switching in literature, and there's a vast uh, array of U.S. Latino literature written in code switch format, most of which actually sounds pretty much like what you might hear on the street, again, Ilan Stavins has offered a purported translation of the first chapter of Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote into what he calls Spanish. Since, again, this is not a natural language, uh, it's difficult for a human being to approximate it. I'll read only the first sentence to give you an idea of what I think Stalin's means by this. In un placete de la mancha, of which nombre no quiero remembrarme, vivía not so long ago, uno de esos gentlemen who always tienen una lanza in the rack, una butler antigua, a skinny caballo, y un greyhound para el chase. Okay, and it, it, it's better. Or worse. This grotesque creation not only contains numerous syntactic violations of code switching, but also phonotactically unlikely combinations in either language, sadleaba, to saddle a horse, and phonetic imitation of popular or uneducated Spanish, for example, pa instead of para, verdad, for verdad, the truth, which reinforce the notion that only uneducated people speak Spanish. This, of course, is coming from an erudite uh, Mexican expatriate who's doing this. Stalin's experience in the United States have given him ample exposure to legitimate code switching, and his own expository prose writings, all, he demonstrates considerable proficiency in the code switch format. Although Stalin does not acknowledge his translation as a parody, a possible source could be his own former students' deliberate renderings of the Pledge of Allegiance, the United States Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence into a humorous but obviously non-authentic mixture of language. And he quotes some of these. This is the thing students tuned in, turned into him at one point as a joke. Uh, for example, from the Pledge of Allegiance, Yo pledgeo alianza a la bandera de los United States de America. Um, and then from the uh, preamble, Nosotros holdeamos que estas truths son self-evidentes, and so forth and so on. Although Stavis regards these in inventions as, quote, an exercise in ingenuity, showing astuteness, a stunning capacity to adapt, and an imaginative aspect that refuses to accept anything as foreign, unquote, with several lapses there, many observers, particularly in Spanish-speaking countries, have taken Stavis' translation of the Quixote at face value and have used it as a platform from which to hurl charges of the linguistic self-immolation of Spanish in the United States. It's a huge debate, and you go on the internet and there's chat rooms and web logs and articles and editors throughout the world which simply say, well, if this is what Spanish is, we don't want any part of it. Um, Stalin's also he, uh, attempted to write in what he considers Spanish, uh, rewrite certain things that were classic works in English. Uh, but he never published them. Perhaps if he had published equally long segments of revered works originally written in English, rather than just attempting what he called famous first lines, an English-speaking audience would also have been offended by his version of Spanglish. For example, again, from his supposed first famous first line of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, again attempting a non-natural language, you no sabe de mi sin you leer un book by the nombre of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer, pero eso ain't no matter. Okay. If someone said, this is what English is becoming, we'd be horrible. Let's turn now to the Spanish of vestigial and transitional bilingual speakers, also sometimes taken as uh, what Spanglish is. The debate on Spanglish and in general the status and vitality of Spanish in the United States is complicated by the existence of thousands of individuals who consider themselves Latinos and whose passive competence in Spanish is considerable, but whose productive competence may fall short of levels produced by fluent native speakers. Educational programs refer to such groups as heritage language speakers, but their impact on the assessment of Spanish in the U.S. has yet to be charted. In classic studies of language attrition in minority communities, the technical term semi-speaker has been used as distinguished from both the fluent bilingual or monolingual speaker of the language in question and from foreign or beginning speakers. In the ontogenesis of semi-fluent speakers, there's usually a shift away from a minority language to the national or majority language within the space of a single generation, or at most two, signaled by a transitional generation of vestigial speakers who spoke the language in question during their childhood, for example, but who have subsequently lost much of their native ability, and also what I call transitional bilingual, trying to avoid the term semi, because in Spanish, they have the term media lengua, which literally refers to half a language, but it's used to people who are tongue-tied or have actually some sort of cognitive deficit. In the United States, there's a well-documented rapid displacement of Spanish in favor of English after at most two generations. Uh, and this has been done by work by uh, Garland Bills, uh, Alan Hudson, and uh, 
and run around his topics looking at census data precisely, at least in the Southwest. Uh, this has created a large and ever-changing pool of transitional bilinguals, representing various national varieties of Spanish and a wide range of active and passive language proficiency. Whereas there exist a few tiny communities of long standing where Spanish as an ancestral language is rapidly disappearing, Spanish as a viable language is widespread in this country. At the same time, within individual families, as well as entire neighborhoods and larger community segments, language shifts away from Spanish are commonplace. Um, at the lower end of active competence in Spanish, transitional bilinguals may produce errors of subject verbs and noun adjective agreement in fashions that approximate those of second language learners of Spanish. Prepositions may be confused or eliminated, articles eliminated or inserted in configurations which are typical of English but ungrammatical in Spanish. Overt subject pronouns, normally redundant and used sparingly in fully fluent Spanish, may be used categorically and repeatedly as in English. In extreme cases, significant grammatical deviations from Spanish syntax, such as stranded prepositions or eliminated complementizers, may be found. But most departures from Spanish morphological syntax are less drastic. More fluent transitional bilinguals may produce no utterances that violate Spanish grammatical restrictions, but may not possess the full range of syntactic and stylistic options found among fully fluent speakers. Transitional bilinguals, most of whom are regarded, and they regard themselves as true bilinguals, are frequently taken as examples of U.S. Latino Spanish, for example, in business, politics, journalism, law enforcement, and the arts, and much of the criticism directed at Spanglish as an impoverished language spoken in the United States stems from confusing the symptoms of transgenerational language attrition with stable bilingualism. In addition to the more than 35 million people called, called Hispanic by the Census Bureau in 2000, most of whom speak Spanish, uncounted millions of other Americans have learned Spanish as a second language through formal education and through life experiences. Many of these L2 Spanish speakers have occasion to use Spanish on a regular basis, on the job and in their personal lives, and many are called upon for impromptu or even official translation and interpretation in situations which frequently exceed their linguistic abilities. Over the past several decades, as Spanish became acknowledged as a language that could no longer be ignored, numerous official and unofficial documents, signs, instruction manuals, and notices have been translated into Spanish and have become cultural and linguistic icons readily available to anyone visiting the United States. Unfortunately, those requesting the translations did not always see fit to see qualified translators or even legitimate native speakers, but often handed the task off to anyone who, quote, knew a little Spanish. The results are not difficult to imagine, and a torrent of broken Spanish that ranged from slightly off kilter to grotesquely unintelligible has greeted Spanish speakers in the United States. There are no data on the frequency with which such unintentional travesties of proper Spanish have been correctly attributed to careless or incompetent second language learners rather than to bilingual Spanish speakers whose command of Spanish has become slipshod through contact with English. However, anecdotal evidence, particularly from abroad, suggests that many first-time visitors to the United States are convinced that the barrage of made-up Spanish that can still be found is tangible proof of the decadent state of Spanish in the United States. Turning now to junk Spanish. I love Jane Hill's term. She started out by calling it mock Spanish, but junk Spanish is much more to the point. Most of us older folks remember Western movies in which even the most loudish cowboy could muster enough lingo to safely navigate the forbidding territories of old Mexico, and perhaps even parley with friendly and hostile Indians with equal facility, of course, in this case speaking, Indian lingo. Peggy Lee could sing mañana in a pseudo-Hispanic accent, and parodies of Spanish clutter the airwaves from I Love Lucy to Lawrence Welk. Nowadays, Americans are immersed in a morass of what Jane Hill calls junk Spanish, typified by menu items at Tex-Mex restaurants, jokes and stereotypes found in mass media, and the names of streets, buildings, and subdivisions, even in the least Latino parts of Middle America, which juxtapose real and invented Spanish words with total disregard for grammatical concord and semantic coherence. When the most difficult situation can be shrugged off with a wink and a conspiratorial no problemo, when one gets business done by talking to the head honcho, he moans a junkie El Chico product, and criticizes a teenage male for showing his macho, who can doubt that full command of Spanish is as much within reach as a margarita or a breakfast burrito? Even the X-Files, normally sensitive and chivalrous, Fox Mulder, could only think to say when asking a Puerto Rican to not touch a red button, no ho with the rojo. Yesterday's Frigo Bandido has been replaced by today's Spanish-talking lapdog, 